welcome we are looking at the examples of how phase fail models can be used to study microstructural evolution uh, we have looked at uh, several cases uh, in this lecture i want to go back to a problem that we looked at earlier uh, for simplicity's sake uh, when we looked at the grain growth problem earlier we used the same allen kahn model with the same free energy and we looked at how a grain embedded inside another grain actually shrinks now in most of the grain growth problems uh, that is not the kind of microstructure that one encounters in the case of grain growth if you go take a look at a typical grain growth problem for example so you will see lots of grains right so if you if you look at the microstructure okay you will see lots of grains and so in our way of doing phase field modeling we need to describe this microstructure now what does these grains represent each grain represents the orientation of the unit cell in that region with respect to some reference frame okay so you can take that reference frame to be the laboratory coordinate frame for example so i have a reference frame and in this reference frame so i have a unit cell right now this unit cell is rotated in three dimensions so it requires some euler angles or something like that to describe its orientation there are many different ways in which you can describe the orientation and suppose this is oriented this way right so that is one of the grains and maybe so let us call that as orientation one maybe there is another one which is oriented this way okay so that is orientation two maybe another one which is oriented this way okay so let's call it as orientation three so like this if you have n different grain orientations you have to denote each one by a different number so this is a microstructure in which we have about 12 different grain orientations now the order parameter that we used to describe this has to be then it it can be thought of in two ways one way is to think of eta i where i goes from 1 to 12 okay now how do we define these order parameters in the ith grain suppose if i am looking at the sixth grain then eta 6 is equal to 1 the other eta i not equal to 6 are all zero okay so similarly now eta 7 will have in this region eta 7 will be 1 the all the other eta which is not equal to 7 will be zero and the interface between 6 and 7 is a region where eta 7 will go from 1 to 0 and eta 6 will go from 0 to 1 so this region is what is given by this so in the bulk the corresponding order parameter will be unity rest of the order parameters will be zero in the boundary depending on what the boundary is. suppose if it is a triple junction between 10 7 and 6 so all eta 10 eta 7 eta 6 are going to have non zero values at this point between 10 and 7 only eta 10 and eta 7 will be non zero the rest all will be zero so the region where these order parameters take a value between 0 and 1 are the interface regions where they take value of unity is basically that particular orientation where they become zero is a region where some other orientation exists so we can think of these order parameters 
as representing the orientation of the crystallites with respect to some external frame of reference and that is how we describe. We can also think of vector order parameters. I can think of a vector eta which has 12 components 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, etcetera. 12 zeros if it has that would then corresponds to uh, orientation eta equal to 3. Okay. So, we can consider this eta i as the order parameter which describes a microstructure as usual wherever there are gradients in eta i will be the region where there is a grain boundary. Now, we have to write a free energy that describes such a polycrystalline or uh, grain microstructure. Now, we know that at the end for example, out of all these 12, any one of the grains can actually eat up all the others and become a single uh, orientation. All the 12 have the same energy in the single crystalline state because with respect to some external frame of reference, we are describing them as eta 1, eta 2, eta 3, etcetera. It can so happen that eta 3 will survive or eta 8 will survive or eta 12 will survive or eta 11 will survive. Whichever crystal that survives, finally if you go to a single crystalline state, all of them should have the same energy. It should not matter with respect to some arbitrary frame of reference, how I am describing its orientation should not determine its free energy. Which means, we need a free energy such that all the there should be minima corresponding to each eta. Okay. So, so, we need minima for each eta i and the free energy, this is the bulk free energy density, right. The, the bulk free energy density that is F0 that you define uh, should be the same for all it i. So, this is what will make sure that at the end suppose you end up with only one single grain, it will have the same energy it does not matter which i survives. So, we need to write this bulk free energy density. So, this becomes the first problem. So, uh, th there is a particular bulk free energy density which is uh, given by Fan and Chen. Okay. This model was written sometime in uh, 1996, uh, 1997. So, near about 20 years ago. So, Fan and Chen give a free energy bulk free energy density F0 eta 1, eta 2, etcetera up to eta p. So, if you have p orientations, then their bulk free energy density looks like this minus alpha. So, it is a sum over i minus alpha eta i squared by 2 plus beta eta i power 4 by 4, sum runs from i equal to 1 to p. Um, and this alone is not sufficient, you also need cross terms that is because we want to make sure that any one of the eta takes a value of plus 1 or minus 1, then the rest of them should be 0 for the minima. If we, if we just leave with this, then all these order parameters taking a value of 1 will also be a minima. So, we do not want that. Okay. So, we have this gamma summation i equal to 1 to p j not equal to i to p eta i squared eta j squared. So, this is a bulk free energy density for appropriate choice of alpha, beta and gamma will make sure that there are 2 p minima and they are at eta i equal to plus or minus i eta j not equal to i equal to 0. Okay. Now, we are going to restrict our eta to be only on the positive side from 0 to 1 for example. So, that then we are going to get for a system with p order parameters p minima. So, that is how we are going to achieve this. Okay. So, these 2 p minima are at 
for example if I take eta 1 whether it is plus 1 or minus 1 rest of them 0 is a minima eta 2 either plus 1 or minus 1 with rest 0 is a minima and so on. So that is how we get 2p minima and this is achieved for this function provided so there is a condition on the alpha, beta and gamma provided that the gamma is greater than beta by 2 so that is the constraint okay. Now the total free energy density of course once you have the required minima with the required property you can write the free energy density because that is nothing but this F0 which is a function of eta 1, eta 2 etc. up to eta p plus summation i kappa i del eta i squared dv. So this is the free energy density. So we have achieved the uh, first aim namely to describe the uh, thermodynamics of the system using the order parameters we have chosen and their gradients. But this is a very very simple minded model because uh, we are assuming that these etas represent uh, the order parameter. It is not necessary that if you have two orientations the grain boundary energy between them and if you have two other orientations the grain boundary energy that you would have in that case. Uh, need to be the same. In other words, uh, this kappa i that we are assuming for the uh, gradient coefficient actually might depend on what is so. So it it here we have assumed that it just depends on the gradient for the uh, particular order parameter. It uh, need not necessarily be so. So if suppose you have a grain boundary which is given like this let us say this is eta 8 and uh, so this is eta 11 for example and so the kappa might actually depend on 8 and 9 as compared to this suppose this is eta 8 and this is eta uh, say 2 this kappa 8 2 need not be the same. That is because if you go to a textbook like Porter and Easterling, you will see that the grain boundaries can be classified into many different types. Okay. Uh, one of the for classification for example describes grain boundaries as small angle grain boundaries and high angle grain boundaries. Okay. But actually a grain boundary has 5 macroscopic degrees of freedom and there could be special orientations in which the grain boundary region will have perfect matching across planes. So it will have very low energy those are known as CSL or coincident site lattices at the boundary and so on and so forth. So if you actually look at the grain boundary energy for low angle boundaries it varies with the misorientation as it is defined linearly and for higher angles there could be special places where it dips otherwise it just keeps uh, 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 as a constant. So, so typical uh, grain boundary energy um, as a function of the misorientation theta uh, is uh, some function which looks like that. Okay. Now uh, this also should be consistent with the crystalline symmetry and all that. So we are going to make a very very simple minded uh, grain boundary uh, grain growth model in which we are going to assume that this uh, coefficient depends only on the delta eta i and in fact we are going to further assume that this kappa uh, is independent of i for any orientation we are going to use the same kappa. Now that means that we are looking at something like a soap bubble cape so it's not really a grain growth scenario okay so at the towards the end of this lecture we will discuss what kind of modifications need to be done for but for now we are going to assume that all kappa i are going to be the same and as usual we are going to use non dimensional values and we are going to use unity for all kappa i so we have described the microstructure in terms of order parameters and their gradients we have written a free energy in terms of the order parameters and their gradients and so we can actually um, write the evolution equation. So for each eta we need to write an evolution equation and the evolution equation is something like this dou eta i by dou t is nothing but minus L i 
the growth rate of the different boundaries uh, could be different again this might depend on uh, the other order parameter across which this grain boundary is formed again we are going to assume a very simple minded all l irrespective of i is the same and it has a value of 1 that i'm going to assume uh, do f0 by do eta i because uh, this equation is for eta i uh, minus kappa i del squared eta i and uh, because del i squared so it is minus 2 kappa i del squared eta i so this is what the equation is so i is equal to 1 2 etc up to p so there are p equations and coupled equations because this term has all the etas in it is what is to be solved so let us call this as g of i and we are going to solve using periodic boundary conditions so do eta i tilde by do t is going to be minus l i g tilde i and minus 2 uh, k squared and this minus and this minus is going to be plus and uh, um, so l i kappa i so with and from the del squared we are going to get a minus k squared so this remains as minus um, eta i tilde and let us take this at time t plus delta t this being a nonlinear term i want to take it at time t um, so this is g i at time t and so here we are going to say eta i t plus delta t minus eta i t uh, divided by delta t is this quantity minus l i g i tilde t minus 2 l i kappa i k squared eta i tilde t plus delta t so we are going to take this here and we are going to write eta i tilde t plus delta t is going to be eta i tilde t minus l i delta t g i tilde t divided by 1 plus 2 l i kappa i k squared uh, delta t right so this is the evolution equation so we need to write an evolution equation for each one of the order parameters and then that code will then do the grain growth so to show how this works in the numerical implementation scenario i am going to assume that there are six different orientations and because i am using periodic boundary condition uh, I also have to make sure that uh, my initial profile is uh, having um, this uh, periodicity. So to make uh, uh, things easier, so I am going to actually start with an initial profile which is something like this. So, so I am going to take a domain, we are going to do it in 2D and I am going to randomly pick these points and I am going to give a value between 1 and 6. So this could be it is like a 6 sided uh, die that I am costing so if it turns out to be 3 I will call this as 3 and uh, next uh, random so that turns out to be 5 I will call this as 5 and the uh, next uh, uh, grid point I will go and I will uh, roll this die and then if I get to 2 I will call this as 2 and so on. So, so I am going to take the initial domain to be given randomly any of these order parameters and that is the microstructure that I am going to evolve uh, and see how this uh, grain growth scenario works out okay. For doing this I have uh, written the code uh, as you will see that uh, uh, like the model that we have assumed the code is also very very uh, simple minded and uh, there is lots of brute force used in solving this okay. So, it is not very elegantly written but it is written in a very transparent manner okay so it's very easy to see what is happening in the code so that you can understand how the code works and we will discuss some of the issues that one might uh, come across in uh, solving a problem like this. Now, uh, there is should also be a way to look at uh, these microstructures that we are developing uh, of course if there are six orientations uh, then I can uh, look at okay orientation one where are where it is uh, there um, so in some place it will be non-zero it will be unity rest of the places it will be zero so that is grain one 
and then I need to go look at where eta 2 is non-zero that will be the second grain and the rest of the region where it is 0 will be um, the other grains and so on. So there is an easier way to actually look at the grain boundary which is what I have used in the code and that depends on this idea right. So we said that uh, let us look at this grain structure suppose if I have a grain like this and a grain like this I said that eta 1 will be equal to 1 eta 2 will be 0 in this region and in this region eta 2 will be 1 eta 1 will be 0 and in the boundary region is where this boundary is where both eta 1 uh, is not equal to 0 eta 2 is not equal to 0. So what I am going to do is that I am going to define a function called the boundary function and this function is basically eta i eta j it is a double summation i and another summation over j not equal to i. Now as you can see in the bulk all the other etas are 0 so that is always going to give 0 and in this also for example in this region eta 2 will be 0 in this region eta 1 will be 0 so when you multiply eta i eta j that quantity is going to give you 0 here but in this region where both are non zero it's going to give a non zero value so if we plot this function then we will see that it becomes zero in many places those are actually the grains and wherever it is non zero then that those are the grain boundaries so this is a easier way to visualize the boundary structure of course it doesn't tell in the case for example that we are considering there are six different grains so it will it will give you something like this but it will not tell what is this grain, what is this grain, what is this grain, what is this grain okay. So that is not going to happen uh, that is because this information does not worry about what is the grain it, it, it just lights up only the grain boundary so we can see the grain boundary structure which means whatever is away from these boundaries are basically the grains. So to look at actually what this grain is then we have to start plotting eta 1, eta 2, eta 3 and see when this region becomes 1 rest of them become 0 so that will correspond to that particular uh, grain okay. So this is just a trick to visualize the grain boundary structure that I am going to use. So as usual. Uh, we go to the code so let me show you the code um, it is called grain growth uh, fan chen dot OCT after fan and chen who wrote this model. So as usual we first say clear all the variables the figures everything and uh, more off because I want to plot the microstructure as it is evolving and uh, p is 6 because I have assumed that there are going to be 6 different orientations and so kappa 1 to 6 I am assuming they are all 1 and L 1 to 6 I am going to assume all of them to be 1, alpha is 1, beta is 1, gamma is 1, see gamma should be greater than half beta, beta is 1 so half beta is 0 0.5 so gamma should be greater than that I have taken gamma to be 1 so this will have the required number of minima and so I am going to do this on a 64 by 64 system again for simplicity's sake I am not distinguishing between x and y direction everything along x and y directions to be the same dx is the same as dy nx is the same as ny and the first thing so this is a, a new command probably that you have not seen till now. So I am going to define a, a random number generator called uni d r and d okay d stands for discrete and uni it stands for uniform. So it is going to generate a uniform discrete random number between 1 and 6 that is what 6 stands for on a n by n matrix okay. So which means so I have n by n points and for each point I have generated a random number that random number is going to be 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 okay. Now I have defined the 6 order parameters eta 1, eta 2, eta 3 etcetera to be 0 to start with 
then I go look at the phi at a particular point. If it is equal to 1, then I make eta 1 to be 1 at that point, the rest remains 0. If it is 2, then eta 2 is 1, the rest are 0 and so on and so forth. So, this is basically the initial structure that I showed you. This is how I generate the initial structure. And the advantage with this initial structure is now I do not have to really worry about a periodic boundary condition. Automatically, as it evolves, the system will make sure that there is periodic boundary condition because Fourier transform automatically implicitly assumes a periodic boundary condition. Okay. Now, this is the boundary function I said. So, I define B to be 0 at all points initially, and then I define so eta 1 multiplied by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 plus eta 2 multiplying 3, 4, 5, 6 right and then eta 3 multiplying 4, 5, 6 then eta 4 multiplying 5 and 6 and eta 5 multiplying eta 6. Uh, this is because when, when I am multiplying eta 2 for example, I do not have to put eta 1 because eta 1, eta 2 is already here. Okay, so, boundary is defined as summation double summation i and j not equal to i okay. so, or, or j greater than i in this case because we are going in order. So, you can do it like that. So, that is the b. So, now I plot the b and I say view 2 so that I am looking down on this and the pass 0 means it will pass for 0 seconds at that point and then it will plot the next one because we want to see a movie of how this evolution is happening. Okay. So, of course, half n I have to define to define uh, periodic boundary condition half n is n by 2 and I have to define the, um, the grid spacing in the reciprocal space which is 2 pi by n and I have to define the delta t and now. So, I am going to make this a little bit simpler. So, for n equal to uh, 1 to 10, m equal to 1 to 2 let us say. Okay. So, we are going to so, the first and the second both are time loops, but this time loop is there because after every two time steps which is after every time unit because d t is 0.5. So, two time steps will make it 2 into 0.5. So, one time unit I want to look at how the microstructure looks like. Okay. So, for i uh, j and k running from 1 to n I now have to generate this uh, g i. G i is dou f 0 by dou eta i. So, what is that quantity? We know what the free energy expression is. A free energy expression is F0 is nothing but summation i minus alpha eta i by 2 plus beta this eta i squared by 2 eta i power 4 by 4 um, plus double summation with gamma i 1 to p. This is also 1 to p and uh, j not equal to i to p eta i squared eta j squared. So, dou f 0 by dou eta i which is called g i uh, is to be now defined as you know 2 times alpha eta i 2 and 2 will get cancelled. So, I will get minus alpha eta i and then 4 times beta eta i cube 4 4 will get cancelled plus beta eta i cube and then in this because i is the only one j is not equal to i. So, that I do not have to worry. So, it will become plus 2 gamma eta i eta j squared whereas, there is a summation over j not equal to i to p on eta j squared. So, this is the g i. So, that is what is uh, implemented uh, in this code. So, uh, we will take a break at this point and then we will go back and uh, see how this implementation and the um, evolution implementation is uh, done in the code. Thank you.